Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the last session of, the, of today. My name is Andrew Wilson, and I am the uh, executive director at the Center for International Private Enterprise, or SIPE, as we call it. And it's, it's our honor today uh, to host this session on how do corporate investors address corruption risk in markets. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, I think uh, this, this is a, a, an interesting opportunity for us to, to get a corporate perspective uh, on how, 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 how these things have, have evolved and, and how thinking about these uh, has evolved. But before I introduce our panelists who come, as, come from as far away as uh, Australia and Ecuador to be with us, I'd like to say a few words uh, to kind of put in mind how SIP thinks about uh, corruption and how we have look at the linkages between uh, this issue and democratic institutions. Um, we, are, we are an organization that was founded at the intersection of, of democratic uh, re resilience uh, and economic reform and private sector development. And for 40 years, we've been working on these issues um, uh, with, with uh, two parent institutions that, that have seen us well on our way, the National Endowment for Democracy and the US Chamber of Commerce both of which kind of help us get a unique perspective uh, on what we're, what we're gonna look at today. But you know, in our work at SIPE, we, we've always been focused on the local business community uh, and how local business uh, community interests align with our interests in reducing corruption, upholding the rule of law, and strengthening democratic institution. And we do this with an eye towards improving opportunity for people in a society. We want to, we want to make sure that everybody has a, has a fair shake when it comes to economic opportunity. But if you will allow me to make this one observation, and that's that in all our work, we've, we've, we've realized that sometimes it's simply not possible to fully align the interests of the local business community with a rule of law anti-corruption agenda. Sometimes their commercial survival is, is, is just in question if they, can't, if they don't uh, uh, bend to, the, to what's going on. And in other cases, local cronyism can breed corruption and it ultimately destroys that atmosphere of opportunity that we want to help create. Happily, there are places where this alignment is in place. Uh, this can happen following an election that brings democratic reformers to power or a new set of economic circumstances, or a common threat to business and society. So you know, think about Sudan's overthrow of its long-term dictator in 2019, or take, for example, allegations of forced labor uh, violations in Malaysia's medical device industry that threatened access to Western markets. In these places, SIP has played a role with local partners to aggressively advance an anti-corruption agenda that is grounded in the rule of law. And often, international businesses can be a powerful ally in making the business case about what dividends will flow from reducing corruption risk in a given country. In other words, when multinationals talk openly about how corruption risk and rule of law inform their business decisions in a given country, that can be a strong argument for local advocates of the rule of law in fighting corruption. But the trick is how do we, how do we build those partnerships and how do we, how do we uh, look at the relationship between these, these two groups? Um, it's about communication. I won't call it coordination. It's about communication between local NGOs and the multinational community. And this can be tricky. It can be a very difficult uh, goal to achieve. But when it works, uh, and what we're gonna hear about today is when it does work, it's powerful in shaping public discussion. And I'll give you a couple of examples of where we've seen this. We, we've seen corporate leadership on these issues. We recently featured a, a standard and chartered bank compliance officer speaking at an Africa-wide event on the corruption barriers to accessing global investment flows. And in effect, Standard & Charter laid out a roadmap for anti-corruption NGOs on how to advocate for reform in their home countries. Earlier this year, our new office in Manila hosted a public forum with the Philippines' oldest and largest conglomerate to talk about anti-money laundering reforms that are necessary to remove the country from the global gray list. A great example of local business leaders highlighting an anti-corruption agenda with universal benefits. But these moments are still all too rare. And we need to further explore how to advance business leadership and partnership on these issues. 
And that's what I'm hoping to learn from this panel. How do we identify those points of overlap between an NGO's rule of law anti-corruption agenda and that of the commercial interests of a company? You know, it's, it's the, it, it, companies now have, have figured out, and we've always said at SIP, you've got to understand the business case uh, for fighting corruption if you're going to get companies to be a long-term partner and to truly grab onto these things and hold them dear. And we're making the business case, and now it's about businesses making the case themselves um, and, and helping and working with the NGO community to do that. Um, so how do we avoid? How do we uh, identify points of, uh, of of overlap where these where these interests coincide um, between NGOs and these issues, uh, and and how do we use these points of overlap to start influencing policymakers to do the right thing when it comes to improving the rule of law uh, and addressing uh, corruption? To help us explore these questions, I'm privileged to introduce our panelists, uh, Tim Robinson, right here. Uh, is the Chief Compliance Officer for the Australian mining giant BHP. He's an attorney, and he previously served as the Director of Transparency International Australia. So he brings both perspectives to our table today. Uh, and then next up we have Dan Bryant. He's the Senior Vice President for Global Public Policy and Government Affairs at Walmart, which is, as we know, the world's largest retailer. Also an attorney. Dan was an assistant U.S. Attorney General under President George W. Bush, so he brings public and private sector perspectives to our table, and, and I hope he might share uh, some of his experience from both sides of the equation with us today. And finally, one of our longtime site partners, Maurizio Salvador, who is the director of Fundación Ciudadanía, I can never pronounce that well, a desarrollo, Bien dicho. Uh, or FCD as I'm going to call it, which is based in Ecuador. It's uh, Maurizio, uh, unfortunately, is yet another attorney uh, who has become a regional expert in human rights, freedom of expression, access to information, citizen participation, transparency, and the fight against corruption. I'm the only non-attorney on the uh, panel, so uh, we'll just make that clear. How we're going to run today's session, uh, we're going to give them each 10 minutes to kind of offer their, their opening perspective. I'll then ask them some very clever questions, which will help elucidate uh, some of the points they've made, and then we're going to hopefully spend uh, a good chunk of time here talking with you moving forward. So I'm going to uh, invite Tim to kick things off, uh, and then we'll go to Dan and then to Maurizio. Tim? Okay, thanks very much, and uh, great to be here, and um, great to see so many, many people coming um, to this session. Um, so first, just by way of background, um, to put this in context, for those of you who don't know BHP, um, we're one of the um, leading global mining companies, and uh, our, uh, our commitment to anti-corruption really starts with our purpose, which is to bring people and resources together to build a better world. Um, at the moment, our, one of our main aims is to expand into uh, transition minerals or future-facing commodities, as we call them, um, primarily copper and nickel. Um, and uh, that's, that's really um, to facilitate the, the energy transition, nickel obviously going into batteries for, um, for electric vehicles. And we also um, look at, have a, a, some interest in potash for sustainable agriculture and iron ore and some steel-making commodities for, for infrastructure. Um, so beyond supporting these needs, we are also proud of the economic contribution that we make to all the communities that we that we operate in. Um, but um, and reflecting on that it really brings us to the issue of of corruption, um, particularly given that a number of those transition minerals are located in countries which have higher risks of corruption, high levels of corruption historically. Um, and as, as a result, I think uh, this is a really critical moment in the global fight against corruption. Um, and if we look at those countries and the opportunities that come from those, uh, from those transition minerals, if developed ethically, um, there are an enormous development opportunity for those countries that could lift millions out of poverty. If not developed ethically, and if there's backsliding on the corruption agenda, then um, the outcome will be far worse, um, more along the lines of a sort of resource curse outcome with instability um, and, and everything that flows from that, and probably delay ultimately in developing those resources, which potentially impacts the climate um, efforts to um, transition um, the um, <clears throat> energy systems as a result. So it is really a critical moment, and um, it's, it's our desire to make sure that those commodities that are developed ethically and those opportunities are realised, which has really made us focus on, on corruption at the moment. Um, 
And so a couple of things that we've been doing recently um, to sort of raise the bar in terms of natural resource governance. Um, we have for some time been supporting the beneficial ownership transparency agenda. Um, and in our industry, that's largely and, and successfully being implemented by the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, which we've been a, we were a founding board member of that and have continued to support, support EITI for many years. Um, it's been a, a great example of, um, of collaboration country by country between civil society, business and government in order to, um, to, to put in place appropriate um, revenue disclosure um, and under the more recent standard contract disclosure um, requirements uh, in each of the adopting countries. So it's been a great success story in terms of a sort of tripartite multilateral engagement model. Um, <clears throat> last year we, um, we sort of reaffirmed and extended the com our commitments to beneficial ownership transparency at a forum um, in London that we hosted with the EITI where we and um, four or five other of the, of the major mining companies signed up to a, um, a, a statement by companies um, further committing ourselves to support beneficial ownership transparency globally um, and making some commitments about disclosing our own ownership and um, explaining how we use um, due uh, sorry how we use beneficial ownership information in our due diligence um, so so that's been particularly important um, one of the other I think one of the, the, the topics for this seminar as well was how we assess corruption risk in our investment decisions. Um, and as you can see um, from what I've said already, we are thinking about corruption risk actively as we, as we look at the investments that we'll be making in coming years into these transition minerals. Um, so perhaps I'll just touch briefly on this and we can happy to go into it in, in more detail in relation, uh, you know, with, with questions after, afterwards. Um, but we have a number of internal processes that, that govern um, our assessment of, of new countries before we um, go into a new country and make an investment. Um, and we obviously do detailed due diligence on those. Um, we um, use a, a mixture of uh, on the ground due diligence and corporate um, indices um, uh, and, and indices published by NGOs such as the, the Transparency International Corruption Perceptions Index to sort of rate countries um, and, and do due diligence accordingly on the, on the level of corruption risk in the country. Not, not exclusively focused on the level of risk, but also focused on opportunities to mitigate that risk. So we look at the anti-corruption um, movement in that country, what reforms have been made, what progress has been made by the government and, and assess the risk in that context as well. Um, I should have said earlier, actually, it's, it's a particularly important assessment for us because our, our business is built around what we call tier one opportunities in mining, which are really large mines, multi-billion dollar investments, multi-decade um, mine life. So we're, the, the, the corruption environment is particularly important for us in providing a, um, you know, a, 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 a stable operating environment um, that's not beset by the types of instability that, uh, that corruption can cause. Um, so there's that assessment which is which is made and uh, and and is uh, is socialized in the company up to decision making bodies as to um, what the level of risk will be and whether the whether the level of corruption risk um, taking into account mitigation opportunities is acceptable or not and sometimes it's not and if it's not we won't we won't proceed with the investment um, also the other way that we take corruption risk into account is we actually have a um, a complex formula. Um, that we feed into our financial models for these very significant investments, which includes a country risk factor. So it's almost like a discount factor in a in a um, in a in a future um, in a future uh, valuation model, um, and uh, that discount factor varies based on a number of characteristics of the country. One of the main ones being corruption and and the corruption environment, but other ones including sort of political instability. Um, you know, civil unrest, human rights, etc. Um, a number of things feed into that, but we actively review those factors, um, and and they get fed into the investment models, which are a critical part of the decision making as to whether we'll go ahead with a project. Um, so, look, that that probably provides a, an an overview. Um, and uh, look, I I think one of the things which is just to wrap up my uh, ten minutes. Hopefully, I haven't gone too far over. One of the things which is uh, really been particularly exciting for me and, and for us being here this week is um, it is the the great alignment of interests which I think we have at the moment between um, business, um, civil society and government and I um, more than really ever before in the anti-corruption movement which I've been working in for decades um, I've, I've, I've sort of seen it, heard it and felt it here this week and I think that's really exciting um, and uh, 
going to your introductory comments, I'm, I'm really quite optimistic about the potential to, um, to take that forward. Great. Thanks, Tim. And, and a couple of observations I'd love to, I, I'd love to offer uh, in, in, in the statements that you made. You know, SIPE um, has worked for almost three decades now on corporate governance work. And early on in my career, uh, I was, was doing a lot of our corporate governance work. And, and at the time, it was really focused on you know, financial transparency in the organization and shareholder rights and, you know, very important issues. But at the boardroom level, that was what the focus was uh, primarily. And the transition that's happened that I think we need to appreciate in corporate governance in general is the move to risk management. Uh, and and in, in some corporate governance circles, you'll hear people say that risk management is the new corporate governance. Um, that, that directors of firms now have to think about things they didn't have to think about 20 years ago. Uh, and that the issue of compliance, the issue of, of, of risk, the fact that, that anti-corruption is part of your risk assessment now or your, or your country assessment, your investment assessment up there with infrastructure or personal security or other areas is, is, is a real sea change, I think, uh, in, in boardrooms uh, in the last uh, 20, 10 years, I would say, uh, really with the advent of the FCPA and other uh, UK Anti-Bribery Act and other areas where companies really do have to focus on this as a, as a compliance issue, not just an ethical issue, and it helps make the business case for good systems in firms and, and throughout supply chains. Uh, speaking of supply chains, uh, here's Walmart, uh, with probably some of the most uh, wide-reaching supply chains in the world, although you're not here to talk about supply chains, um, but an organization um, that really, really is one of, the, one of, our, one of our world's largest global uh, companies uh, and with interests in so many different kinds of markets. And so, Dan, I'm going to ask, ask you the, uh, to, to, address, to address our question about how do companies look at these issues and, and move them forward? Thank you, Andrew. <clears throat> um, it's a delight to be with you. Um, the most important thing I can do over the next few minutes, I think, is to introduce my, my wonderful colleague, my partner in anti-corruption, not my partner in crime, my partner in anti-corruption, Welby Lehman. Welby, uh, wave your hand. That wasn't high enough, Welby. Wave your hand higher, Welby Lehman, um, who's just an invaluable resource to a lot of the important uh, policy work regarding anti-corruption that's underway in D.C. and throughout the hemisphere and beyond. So uh, we're privileged to have uh, someone of Welby's expertise and depth uh, uh, and care uh, for this issue uh, at Walmart, and he really is a resource far beyond Walmart. So important that you, you, you know Welby is here as that resource. We were speaking briefly just before uh, we started the panel about the trust crisis. And I think one thing that we would bring as a global re retailer is the conviction that the trust crisis is real. Uh, and it can be measured a lot of different ways, but trust in institutions broadly across sectors is diminished. Uh, and uh, tragically, COVID has only exacerbated uh, this problem of trust. Um, we would like, we as Walmart, would like to be doing our part within the business community, working across sectors to be doing something about that trust crisis. And it feels to us that a whole lot of people who are wondering who they can trust and what institutions they trust uh, are looking to um, those of us privileged to have some influence within our sectors to see if we can figure out how better to work together, to leverage our various competencies uh, in a way that really can uh, move the needle um, positively for them. Um, as Walmart, I would say we come at this as learners, as, as very much in a learning mode. We want to learn how to uh, be supporting uh, different sectors uh, more effectively. Uh, we've had a lot of um, tough experiences uh, in this space that has, has taught us some important lessons. Um, and so we, we, we bring that uh, into, into the discussion. Uh, and we want to be learners regarding what, what is our best role in supporting the important work uh, that you're doing. Uh, so I hope that that conversation can continue. Um, we do think that the key is indeed partnering across the sectors to create stronger public institutions. We have an initiative that we've been privileged to be part of called Digital Tools for Rule of Law and Resilient Recovery. Digital Tools, so Digital Tools for Rule of Law and Resilient Recovery. 
as we as we think about uh, distressed um, uh, societies and and distressed uh, regions and countries, recovery is always something we're, we're keenly focused on coming out of COVID all the more. That acronym is a, a, a mouthful, but I'm going to be speaking a little bit about digital tools for rule of law and resilient recovery. Um, we have found this um, to, be, to be hard, but we have learned a lot from working with our suppliers, with customers, with governments, and the range of stakeholders with whom we have to interact uh, where we are doing business or looking to invest. Um, we have found that moving the needle on anti-corruption requires going beyond just focusing on the nuts and bolts of compliance, as important as that is. Right information to the right people, right training of the right people, um, but going beyond that uh, and, and really um, looking to um, play a part in creating a culture of anti-corruption, of strengthening the informal norms around public institutions that are interacting with, with businesses and making decisions related to business investment and growth? How do we strengthen those informal norms that are the air that is breathed by compliance programs and compliance officials? Um, we further come to, to believe and I, um, that, that unless we um, succeed in aligning the incentives across uh, these different sectors that have responsibility regarding anti-corruption, uh, that we, we ultimately won't succeed. And so we have um, come to really call out and value highly um, the, the goals of transparency, inclusive growth, uh, and resilience. It's interesting to think about COVID, it's taught us a number of, of important things. And, and in our view, it, it makes the timing right to think about uh, moving forward with this initiative. Um, yes, uh, corruption uh, survived and even thrived um, during uh, COVID, but um, it, it supercharged the opportunity for e-transparency uh, and e-transparency reforms um, and really helped overcome some longstanding um, sort of lack of, of, of will regarding e-transparency. Um, COVID uh, paralyzed in-person and, and paper operations, and it really opened the door to seeing how uh, e-transparency uh, and digital tools could, could help um, continue um, allowing decisions to move forward. Um, I think there's a growing pressure on governments and society and business, and we feel this as we are uh, operating in different parts of the world, to build more inclusive economic growth. So what do governments typically want Walmart to do? They want us to do two things more than anything else. They want us to go where business isn't and create jobs where they currently aren't. And they want us to then really involve local businesses in our, in our supply chain. Weak rule of law sabotages our ability to do uh, both of those things. Let me just um, note the, the issue of licensing and permitting, an area that's notoriously uh, non-transparent. Um, all of us across uh, all sectors uh, have to be more involved in, in designing and implementing better systems, more transparent, uh, easily uh, accessed uh, systems. It's interesting, we often end up helping our suppliers um, build their capacity uh, to be compliant, uh, to be more uh, high standard, but it's harder uh, for suppliers to sustain those high standards uh, when there's an absence of, of rule of law, where rule of law is weak. The trust challenge for suppliers in some ways really starts with licenses and permitting and tax compliance. It's the two things that all of our suppliers uh, routinely uh, are involved in or are obliged to do, tax compliance and to pursue uh, the necessary licenses and permitting that, that they require. Um, so all sectors really need to be involved in working to design uh, those best systems. Um, for our small suppliers, for example, e-invoicing is, is, is essential that it be mobile friendly. 
Uh, they've gone mobile. Uh, E-invoicing has to be mobile friendly uh, or, or it really won't, won't work for them. When you add then customs administration and public procurement, you've basically covered uh, the big four. Uh, license and permitting, uh, tax compliance, customs administration, pub public uh, procurement. Um, but really in some ways, the greatest immediate um, positive uh, effects are there when um, e-transparency uh, is, is, is moved on. Yes, procurement is rightly an area of, of, of great priority for all the reasons we recognize, but licensing and permitting is key to getting and maintaining uh, investment and growth and to catalyze it sooner than later. Uh, licensing and permitting in some ways really undergirds inclusive uh, job creation. It allows that small business uh, to start and, and to move forward. So we, we are delighted to be here. Uh, perhaps uh, during our Q&A we can discuss more uh, the program uh, regarding digital tools for rule of law, um, which, uh, which we're so encouraged to be part of. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dan. A uh, couple of quick observations. Uh, I was recently, uh, e-governance and 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 um, you know e-procurement in these systems are, are are definitely the wave of the future, and it's been something of a mantra, I think, in in the anti-corruption uh, field for for quite some time. That we we look at e-governance as almost sort of this this holy grail black box that's kind of sitting up on on the horizon. We recently, uh, I recently was in Colombia, and we because I. Um, did a did a survey in in several countries in Latin America on people's experience with with e procurement in particular public e procurement uh, in particular uh, and what I took away from that is that there's 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 good governance and there's poor governance and there's good e governance and there's poor e governance and you simply cannot take a poor system and translate it into a digital format and think your job is done. Uh, and, and you know, we really do need to make sure that we're creating systems that are accessible, that are easy to use, that are transparent and responsive. Uh, so people's experience with these platforms. And I think the private sector has a lot to bring to the table in that discussion with government. We, we, we partner uh, at SIPE on a, on a large program called the Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation which is a public-private partnership that, that looks at e-governance primarily at the frontier, in, in the customs office, where you, you, were, you were noting that people have so many problems. And what we learned from that public-private partnership, and I think one of the areas we need to explore more, is how do you tap into the private sector's expertise in certain areas, how they understand it. So, so um, you know, Dan kind of hinted at it, that you know, Walmart does a lot of procurement. Walmart has been able to use a phone in order for people to make it accessible and make it easy to use and make it transparent. If we're going to have good reforms uh, in the e-government phase, we, we, should, we should hope that that kind of expertise uh, is available for governments. But getting back to the point that, that, that Dan made, first of all, trust becomes an issue, right? So if, if Walmart is there to say, would you like to look at our platform? It requires the trust and the transparency of that of that uh, relationship uh, to make sure that people feel that that's a legitimate exchange of information, that nobody is benefiting from that. And creating the atmosphere for, for relationships of trust, I think, um, becomes really critical. I just referenced Latin America. Ecuador was one of those countries in which we did that survey, by the way. But Maurizio, um, you know, it's it's your turn to, to give us that perspective uh, from 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 the from the local level on what you're seeing in, in regard to these opportunities, but also these challenges. Thank you, Andrew. Good afternoon to everyone. First of all, I want to thank SIP for the invitation to join in the panel. I really feel comfortable sharing the table with you. This usually doesn't happen in my country. And I'm going to mention that, and Saib knows very well about the hard situation and the hard relation between civil society and private sector. During the last uh, few years, Ciudadanía y Desarrollo and Saib have worked together to carry out joint actions and programs to promote integrity and transparency, not only at the public sector, but also at 
the private sector. We have been very successful in working together to promote transparency at the extractive industry and in the infrastructure, always seeking and having like a main point on articulating efforts between civil society and the private sector. I must also congratulate SAIP for inviting representatives of these two important multinationals that I think are not present in my country, and I was wondering why. Why, as we were discussing earlier, we don't have Walmart in Ecuador. Ecuadorians suffer of a duopolio, a duopoly, of two big supermarkets that act with very, very corrupt practices to don't allow another, a third one, to go into the country. So maybe it's not the citizen's fault, it's not the public sector's fault, it's the private sector's fault. So there is a problem even inside the private sector as well. So thanks then, thanks Tim, and I think that after listening to me, you are going to think that I came here to play the role of the bad guy. But not everything I'm going to say is, is bad. I think that uh, when learning about public sector corruption and private sector corruption, it is very helpful to keep in mind that there are huge differences between the two sectors. Public sector corruption public, uh, basically abuses government resources but the private sector corruption primarily abuses private or commercial resources. And there are many, many companies that are also victims of the private sector corruption. UNCAC, UNCAC, the United Nations Convention on Anti-Corruption, defines a number of different offenses, corruption offenses. And corruption is always from our side, understood in general terms as the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. That's our definition, as I mentioned in Transparency International. And, and it is very clear that uh, from both the TI definition of corruption, as well as the corruption offenses defined at the UNCAC, corruption occurs more, both in the public and the private sector. Based on UNODC's work, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, corruption in businesses is defined as a universal problem affecting companies of all sizes in all countries. Companies could be both, as I mentioned, victims as well as perpetrators of corruption. And in a business context, corruption can include false or misleading financial reporting, procurement fraud, tax evasion, and other kinds of acts. I must say that at Ciudadanía y Desarrollo, we believe in open government. And for this reason, we actively promote open government principles in the country, at the national and at the local levels. As I think you know, one of the fundamental principles of open government is collaboration, the coordinated work between actors from all sectors. And not only with the support of SIP, but also with the support from other donors, we have managed to get important civil society organizations to join our cause. We just started the open government thing in the country. And not only work with each other between us, between civil society organizations, but also seeking to coordinate actions with the academia, the private sector, and the public sector as well. But the most difficult part, as I mentioned, has been to involve the private sector in open government processes. We have been very successful in working together to implement in the country international initiatives as EITI at the extractive industries, as well as the cost initiative related to infrastructure. And based on those small spaces of collaboration, we were able to overcome this mistrust that is so strong in the country, and we were able to push forward together processes that we know will benefit all of us. 
Despite the lack of trust and the weak relationship that in Ecuador and other Latin American countries exist between civil society and the private sector, I believe that, are, that there are several points that we must consider. First, dialogue is necessary. In that sense, if it exists, it must be strengthened and keep alive. If it doesn't exist, we must create dialogue spaces. And I think the initiative must come from the civil society. We must try and we must do several efforts until the channel between the both sectors will allow us to work together, pushing forward integrity and transparency in the country. Second, I think that uh, teamwork that we are doing, this kind of initiatives I mentioned, must be strengthened. For this, private sector must do what public sector is not able to do. For example, private sector must be tolerant of criticism and accept critis, critics from civil society. We play a role of criticism, always. But our critics usually come with a proposal. That's what we do at Ciudadanía Desarrollo, and that's what we do in other NGOs that are part of this Transparency International Movement. And as I said this morning in, in another panel I participated, I think there are things that uh, we have achieved together, both sectors, with initiatives as the one I mentioned, and, and we must ensure together to keep this positive achievements alive. And based on that, I think we must do at least three actions. The first one, keep bringing together actors from civil society, journalism, private sectors, and citizens in general to work together on transparency and integrity. Andrew, you mentioned, for example, what happens with public procurement. And in Ecuador, we have been very successful working with the private sector in changes in our public procurement system, the national public procurement system. We have adopted, adopted open contracting standards in the country, and we are working together in improving the quality of the information and the data that's given to citizens. In this capacity, strengthening is a key issue, as well as having joint activities. We have involved more actors in this kind of processes because we know that it's very easy to end with an individual effort, but it's really difficult to do it when it's a collective effort. Maybe you don't understand what I'm talking about, but from 2007 to 2017, we had a government that persecuted and prosecuted civil society organizations and activists. And it was really easy to persecute an NGO when one NGO by itself led the process. But when we were working together, the government really thought before initiating, even initiating an action against us. So, again, working together, making collective efforts, give us better results. Second, together, I think we must open and keep open the communication channel with the government and the authorities. I know that, better, that there's a better relation between the private sector and the government because there's money involved. But if we work together to keep open this communication channel, thinking above money, it will be definitely better. We must also understand in this case that working together with the authorities as well, not only being at one side and they in another side, is vital to achieve results in these collaborative efforts that we are pursuing. And finally, I think that uh, there is also a huge possibility of having good results and reducing corruption risks if we just not focus our efforts at the national level. Because I think in all countries around the world, corruption also affects 
local governments. And for example, you were discussing about licenses and permits. They are related to local governments. So our efforts in favor of transparency and integrity must go down to the local governments as well. And we must think also that people, citizens, feel their local governments closer. So that's why that's a better space for working together. I think, Andrew, those are my 10 minutes, and we'll keep discussing this with the questions. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Maurizio. Uh, good points all. Um, and as a democracy organization, I, you know, I'm, I'm immediately attracted to the idea of dialogue and keeping channels open and, and, and keeping, keeping the discussions going. Uh, you know, in, in addition to everything else we faced in the world over the last five or 10 years, uh, the, the, the democracy deficit is also something that I think affects the work that we do and we have to, uh, as believers in open government and transparent society, I think take to heart the fact that we also have a role in strengthening democracy through our actions and, and maintaining an open dialogue and being constructive on all sides of the dialogue, I think, is, is, is very key to doing that. But probably, uh, this again, we get back to the issue of trust and habit and, 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 and also finding the wins. So, you know, you, if you don't get wins out of the work that you're doing, it's very difficult to sustain the effort. So identifying those early wins and, and the quick wins, as we like to call them, I think has to be part of a formula. But I think that kind of gets me to the, the question I want to ask of Tim, because uh, he does bring both a civil society and a private sector perspective uh, to his work. Uh, and, you know, we talk about incentives, we talk about, uh, about these issues. What can the private sector offer in, 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 in the ways of, of incentives, and, and your work at BHP might inform some of this, on, on sort of your model of engagement with civil society? How, how, do, you, how do you provide the incentives and the credibility for, for the work that you do when you want to engage civil society? Yeah, thanks, Ilka. Yeah, sorry, that's working again. Um, thanks, Ilka. I think there's, um, I mean, one of the things that's important, I think, is that there are um, incentives on both sides. Um, and I think both sides of the of that relationship need to need to see some value. And um, where I've seen it really, um, where, where we've seen great value in our engagement with, um, with civil society is civil society as um, what we might refer to as an honest friend. Um, so someone who will tell you the truth about yourself, um, make an intervention if they need to, and uh, tell you where you're going wrong. So that, that, is, that is incredibly valuable information for us to receive. Um, it doesn't need to be conveyed publicly. Um, if there's a trusted relationship, it can be, a, it can be a, a super valuable private discussion. So getting that perspective um, in, bringing the outside in, as we sometimes refer to it, is, is really useful um, um, to, to a big company. Um, going back the going back the the other way, um, I, I think um, those engagements are, are always very useful to stimulate ideas and ideas for reforms and, and things like digitisation and everything you've talked about. I think a lot of those ideas, beneficial ownership transparency is another one where it was really born out of of, of engagement between civil society and um, academia and and, uh, and and our industry. And once those ideas are developed, I think what corporates can bring and what, what the private sector can bring is, is um, potentially the ability and influence and commercial leverage to make those things happen. Um, and so we, um, sort of going back to our, our, um, our, our commitment to, to EITI and our beneficial ownership transparency commitments, I mean, one of the things that we, we really wanted to do consciously with the statement that we signed up to last year was to send a really clear signal um, to our whole supply chain and to the smaller parts of the mining industry, so the junior exploration companies or others that one day um, we may want to acquire, that beneficial ownership transparency is absolutely critical to us. So we wanted to send that signal through our supply chain that we're, if we're engaging you as a supplier, we're expecting transparency about ownership and also to the, to, um, to the junior exploration companies, if you, if you want us to buy you, um, well then we're expecting to see um, full ownership transparency as well. And so trying to use that, um, that commercial leverage, I guess, um, to, to um, implement and, and, and build out um, a, a great concept like um, beneficial ownership transparency is, is something which I think the private sector can bring. 
I, I think, you know, when we talk about beneficial ownership, it, it's an interesting case of how uh, what started off as a, as a sort of a civil society um, drive, if you will, and something that they saw as, uh, uh, as an important step towards countering kleptocracy and other issues um, becomes a business practice, and it, and, and it becomes a business practice for the right reasons. Uh, and and one that trickles through the supply chain for the right reasons and 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 I think what you've highlighted here is really um, that there is there's a two way relationship two way relationship here that that can operate that there are things that that if if the arguments are structured well if the incentives are clear to the private sector um, that the business case can be made for for uh, you know transparent and uh, ethical behavior and then as I as I s said earlier then business can make the case uh, uh, on the other way around um, Dan I, you know I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more from you uh, concretely about what Walmart has been doing uh, at the local level in terms of how it works with with uh, civil society on anti-corruption efforts um, thanks Andrew um, I would offer a few quick thoughts from our from our vantage point. Um, we have been focused in terms of uh, the subject matter of this cross sectoral work on um, designing and implementing um, in collaboration with the other the other appropriate sectors, starting with government, um, on in three areas that we think really are. Uh, crucial unlocks for investment and um, and business growth in a sustained way. Uh, the first is uh, mandatory e-invoicing. Uh, the second is the single digital window uh, for all permits. And the third is uh, online uh, public procurement. In some ways, the heart of this uh, digital tools for uh, rule of law and resilient recovery is focused on these kinds of concrete um, steps um, where there would be um, training and credentialing by uh, the, the right the right bodies of uh, those those uh, actions having been implemented uh, in a kind of best practices uh, sort of way. Um, you talk about early wins, um, quick wins. Uh, you could see how all of those would be consistent with small businesses, which is really where the inclusive growth comes from, small businesses being able to um, get a stake in the economy and to open that door and, and begin doing business. Um, so we have seen how these can uh, really build um, the, the the trust and and help strengthen rule of law in ways that um, that that do it do um, extend um, inclusive growth. Um, I would say, in terms of um, the nature of our work together, uh, one perspective uh, that I've heard uh, usefully put regarding corruption is that in some ways it's it's uh, the wrong kind of uh, relationships. Uh, between um, sectors. Um, it's sectors interacting. It's them interacting in wrong ways, in illegal ways. And so the way we work together really needs to be conspicuous in the way that it's a model for sectors interacting rightly. And as we can begin to, to do that, um, learning from each other, um, listening to each other, and I appreciate the perspectives uh, that have been shared here, including uh, from Mauricio. Um, I think that really does uh, signal uh, in important ways uh, how earnest how earnest we are. Um, uh, the last thing I would just say is that um, our process for, for how we collaborate itself needs to be transparent and inclusive. Uh, and that'll make it a little messier as we're looking to uh, collaborate and bring actors into the way that we then uh, try to move forward. But that messiness is essential for for uh, the process to be credible, for it to be seen to be credible, and for us to get to to the right outcomes. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Dan. And, and you know, I, I think at the at the heart of 
a lot of the work that we do, the idea of opportunity and prosperity um, for communities and, and sort of the, the hidden tax that corruption is, is, is at, a, at a core of a lot of that work. And, uh, you know, we're very, I think everyone's really excited about the prospect of, um, you know, digital commerce and, and, and the tools that you were, you were uh, reflecting on. Um, you know, a lot of the work that we've done at SIPE over the years is, is rule of law based. It's, it's looking at these issues, okay, you can have the practice, but if you can't enforce it, if you can't adjudicate it, it, it makes it so much more difficult to move forward. And I think the, the big issue that we're still grappling with in terms of, of digital commerce and e-commerce and the potential for it to work well is, are the same rule of law issues that we've been working with in a non-digital environment. Uh, and we're, we're still struggling with, with how to even take the rule of law online uh, in terms of global best practice and, in, and then onward in terms of how local authorities and local, uh, local public structures can actually use those systems and what are the rules of privacy and data storage and all the things that, that go along with that. And that it, it is a very robust discussion and it is a discussion on which there are competing values. Um, you know, uh, there, there, there are a set of values which, we'll, for lack of a better term, we'll just call maybe liberal democratic values, the traditional business values that we talk about, a traditional rule of law values. But there are now competing schools of digital governance, of, of commerce, uh, that, that, that hide under the guise of saying, uh, you know, uh, local, local autonomy or, or, or self-governance or other terms that, that are used really that are just there to keep a keep a, an entrenched interest in power, without naming names or countries in those areas, and it's a real competition. I think we have we have to get engaged in at a global level to say that if we're going to have ru effective rule of law, if we're going to have effective systems uh, at a local level, if we're going to use digital commerce to be this tool to open up societies and to provide opportunity, we also have to take seriously uh, the competition of values that it's very real and, and moving forward. Uh, right now, Maurizio, your your country's on on the front lines of of some of these battles. Uh, I know from some of the research that you've done and other groups have done. Um, that's not what we're here to talk about today. But I would like to to um, to to kind of push you a little bit more on. Um, you know, we, we've heard some very positive examples of, of ways in which corporate experience can can inform anti-corruption strategies. But there are there are some hurdles in the way. There are some very real obstacles that we need to address to make this work. Uh, in your experience, uh, working in, in a sometimes difficult environment, what do those look like? Uh, and and what, what are your thoughts? You, have, you, had a, you had a great one, two, three list. I'm wondering if you have a one, two, three list for, for how we overcome some of these barriers too. And, and Andrew, before answering your question, uh, and earlier I said exactly the same, uh, you mentioned something that is key, democracy. <laughs> and I was telling the audience I had in another panel earlier that a few months ago, the Latin American chapters of Transparency International had a meeting in Guatemala for analyzing what we have done during the last years and, and planning the upcoming years and what we're gonna do. And the sad thing is that after three days of discussion, we came to a very harsh conclusion we must go back to basics. And I'm gonna repeat it, back to basics. What does this mean? In this case, I know that the private sector has a priority in doing business. And this is not the main topic of this panel, but transparency and integrity at any level is only possible if we live in full democracies with open civic space. Freedom of expression, freedom of association, the right to peacefully protest, it's not only for civil society. It's also for the private sector. It's for every single citizen. We must live in democracies with open civic spaces, with rights and freedoms fully warranted, with dialogue spaces between our sectors, joining forces together, without fear of facing any consequence from the government, any action from the government. We cannot focus on transparency, openness, open government, open contracting, 
if we don't live in full democracies. And our region, Latin America, is, is having a very, very hard time right now. You saw what happened in Peru <laughs> yesterday. That's how fragile our democracies are. If we don't stop together, authoritarianism and totalitarianism, if we don't work together, I'm not sure if we are going to have good conditions for doing business in our countries. Private sector, I think, plays a key role in keeping democracies alive or in fighting against dictators. And in Ecuador, during the period I mentioned, I saw many representatives from the private sector working together with our local dictator because doing business is definitely better than having a democracy. There is a big challenge, and I know that there are companies, multinationals like yours, that are responsible with democracy. So what you are doing in other countries, and you mentioned, must be done with other companies that are present in our countries. Now answering your question, Andrew, I think that there are, there are many factors that have caused uh, this uh, hard situation, hard relation, difficult relation between NGOs and the private sector in general, not only with, with multinationals as the one represented here. As I mentioned, the starting point is recognizing that there is a corruption problem inside the private sector itself. And in Ecuador, and in several countries of our region, there was a big problem, and, and, and it was like one of the biggest barriers we confronted. The private sector recognizing that they are actors in corruption and not just victims. I always tell the story of going, and, and our partners from SIP know very well, as Quito Chamber of Commerce is one of your partners as well, that a few years ago, we went to Quito Chamber of Commerce, and we said, we must fight together against corruption, but the first step is you recognizing that you are part of the problem. And there was such a huge fight between us, that we weren't even able to talk to the president of the Chamber of Commerce for many years. Because they said that they were victims. Can you imagine how sad it is for an NGO like the one I lead to hear representatives from the private sector saying that they even included money for corruption in their annual budgets and justifying this action on the necessity of generating jobs. We have this amount in our budgets because we must pay money to the public sector to keep these jobs alive. We have to pay bribes. We have to work together with this corrupt system if we want to keep our businesses alive. That's what we have heard there. These statements generate mistrust, Andrew, because there are many civil society organizations who, who hate this kind of actors, who, who don't see any possibility of working together after hearing things like this. So it's not easy at all to, to try to trust again. There's also a problem related to human rights. You know there's a huge thing on businesses and human rights. And you know in countries like mine, there's a huge human rights movement that plays a key role in open government and plays a key role in, in transparency and integrity actions. And when we try, based on open government principles, to put the, everyone together in one table to discuss about transparency, uh, civic participation, and, and collaborative efforts, they say, no, we are not going to sit with the private sector because they violate human rights. So we also have to overcome this problem, you know, corruption is not only related to the misuse or bad use of public funding, it's related to the abuse of power. And 
you know, rule of law doesn't depend only on if we like or we don't like our constitution and our laws and regulations. If you believe in rule of law, you have to respect the laws. I hate my labor regime in the country. It's a very bad legal regime. It makes almost impossible to start a business in the country. But unfortunately, we have to respect those laws. But again, based on corruption, there are many, many businesses from the private sector that break the law and start actions violating human rights. And the victims, citizens say, that's why we hate the private sector. So it's not easy, but it's not just the bad thing. I know that I'm like the bad guy I mentioned here, but I must admit that there are several companies and corporations in the country, not as big and as nice as yours, that have understood that much can be gained from transparency. And they have decided to carry out actions together with civil society that range from the implementation of compliance programs together with civil society or directly support civil society initiatives on transparency and integrity in the public sector. There are several companies in my country that work, for example, to improve, as I mentioned, the national public procurement system. There was a huge change. There has been a huge change in the national public procurement system during the last five years with the collaboration of the private sector, with the collaboration of the chambers of commerce. <laughs> we finally work together. Even the chambers of commerce, not only uh, in studies like the ones you run, not only in Ecuador, but in Colombia and Peru, we're able to generate data and information that was not available at our local government and gave to the citizens that information and data to improve living conditions in the city. So I think there's a good opportunity and, and I think this is a great opportunity to show results of our teamwork and the best way to convince others that we must join forces for integrity and transparency is showing results. Even if they are small results, they must be shown to others. The important thing is to give the first step, to move forward, to show people that, as I said, working together, we can achieve better results, thinking that we are all citizens and we must all work together for democracy, transparency, integrity, and civic space. Thank you very much, Maurizio. We're going to open the floor to, to, to questions right now. And, and while we take the mic out, Holly over there has the microphone. And she's going to spot people and just carry the microphone to them. But I will say this lady uh, in the red jacket was, had her hand up first, so we will go to her. But while we're waiting for the microphone to make its way across the room, um, you know, I, I think I think two observations I'll, I'll offer. I, years ago, I worked on anti-corruption work uh, in Russia. And you can imagine how I felt having to do that uh, for a long time. But what was interesting is that the Russian chambers and the Russian business community, when it came to designing you know, interventions for the private sector there, said, just to your point, don't bother coming to the table unless you're clean yourself or else you're ready to talk about how you got clean. Because if you can't talk about that, then you'll never have the credibility to, to sit at the table with, with, with the community. Um, the second piece, I, I, and I'm glad you illustrated with the Keto Chamber and some of the others that did eventually um, do the right thing, if you will, um, is what is the value added of the, of the private sector? And we, we, I think we need to use our imaginations a bit more, and it's a challenge I throw out as much to companies as I do to, to, to the activist side of the community. There's so much value and knowledge in the private sector on systems, on laws, on other things that could be of value. It's not just about sponsoring a, 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 an event, but there are other ways in which the expertise of the private sector and compliance or other issues is there to be drawn on. Um, and we need to be more creative, I think, in, in thinking about what the content of these partnerships can look like. So, to you. 
Thanks very much. Please identify yourself. And, sure, and your Liz character. David Barrett from the International Anti-Corruption Academy. Um, I'm running a new program at IACA, which is all about developing new tools for measuring corruption and corruption risk. And we're particularly keen that that is informed by what people actually need in terms of those indicators. So it's a question particularly for Tim and Dan. Could you tell us what kinds of data you use at the moment to inform your decision making? But also, what would be on your wish list? So what are the gaps or the kind of data that you would really need that you don't have at the moment? Well, I'm happy to start. Um, uh, so at the moment, um, what, we, what we use is, a, is a, we use some uh, commercial index providers that sort of collate um, uh, index ratings on particular countries. And that gives us a sort of an initial categorization and then um, we use generally commercial due diligence providers to go on the ground speak to people um, um, widely into including um, including civil society but but and including people in government people in business and and sort of do some some stakeholder engagement and research about the the the, the types of activities but um, I think one one observation um, about that is that that is very good for identifying corruption risks and where levels of corruption are. So quite often we get really useful information from that about, you know, it's this particular process which has got some corruption challenges or, you know, there's this particular um, a particular area of the country or something which might which might have more problems. It's really good on the risk. Where the gap is, I guess, in in those um, in those uh, those sources sometimes is about what's happening in the anti-corruption space. What about on the mitigation side or on the, how much progress is the, is, is the country making on corruption? And that to us is a, is a really key question because every country's got corruption risks um, and um, we can't make an assessment just based on the risk alone. A really key input to our decision is what, what direction are things moving in? What opportunity, you know, is there, going to what some of what Mauricio was saying, is there space for civil society? Is there, is there space, are some of these democratic institutions there? Um, do they present opportunities to, to improve the corruption environment that we can utilise and bring our leverage to bear on? That's a little bit missing. Um, and um, I'm, I'm sure there'd be plenty of um, uh, people with expertise in it, but, you know, basic indicia of effective anti-corruption systems, whether it's independent prosecutors, beneficial ownership, transparency, um, things like that, um, difficult to measure um, in, in, in some cases, but I, that would be my, my reflection on the, the gap in the market, if you like, for information on assessing corruption risk is the, is the mitigation side. As a practical matter, the vast majority of our uh, expansion right now is in countries, in regions where we already are. And so we have a level of familiarity um, that is through uh, our, our business um, operations in country and region and through the uh, various stakeholder relationships and partnerships that we already have in place. We do use uh, law firms and due diligence firms in all the countries where we operate. I'd want to be thoughtful in answering your question about gaps and how best to uh, think about um, uh, plugging any gaps. So I'd be happy to, to follow up with you. Thanks very much. And, and I'll give a shout out to my colleague Frank over here in the front. It's someone you might want to talk to after the, after the event because Frank and his team have been working with the Hurdy School on a, on a corruption barometer to the, the point that Tim made about just the trend line. It's, not, it, it's using a lot of different sources and there's a little bit of alchemy involved, but uh, essentially trying to, to, to get a trend line at least. Uh, as to as to as to what countries are doing in, in in terms of what they are. So who has the microphone next? There, that's the that's the owner. Then hi, I'm Ted Picone with the World Justice Project, and building off of this last point, we produce the Rule of Law Index, which is another data source that's very much bottom up from household surveys and expert surveys of people in the country on outcomes, not just what laws are on the books or what things look like superficially, but actually how people experience corruption in their lives or other bigger democracy rule of law issues. But that's a comment. My question is maybe a little focus on what's happening in the US regarding the ESG, environment, 
uh, social governance indicators that um, investors are increasingly looking at as very important to how they're going to park their money. And there's a very large pushback right now politically against this movement and calling it woke capitalism. And you're seeing states like Florida and Texas actually withholding public monies to companies that um, are pursuing an ESG agenda in their view. And my question would be, particularly maybe for you, Dan, um, whether you see, you talked about in the beginning um, this sea change in the corporate boardroom, um, and I'm wondering if the sea change is, is firm enough that the business community sees this as uh, a really important to the bottom line enough that we're gonna, we're gonna resist this pushback and continue forward? Or do you start seeing voices that are saying, you know, actually, you know, it's easier if we don't have to deal with that stuff and let's go in a different, or back to the old ways? Thanks. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Um, quick thoughts. First, uh, Walmart's a company that um, believes that it has, from its um, beginnings, always been oriented toward collaborating with the stakeholders that are essential to our long-term sustainable growth. It starts with our associates, our customers, um, um, communities, um, and community writ large uh, with an eye toward our impacts on, on the communities where we operate. <clears throat> so we're always looking at this <clears throat> convergence of, of um, what's in the business interest, the associate interest, the customer interest, the community interest, the interests of those stakeholders that are essential to uh, our maintaining our license to operate both formally uh, and informally. In that sense, <clears throat> stakeholder capitalism has always been part of our DNA. You go back and you look at Sam Walton, the founder, he was very much uh, in that way. So in our view, uh, the, the ESG commitments that we're making are commitments that are grounded in, um, in the continued success of the business at that intersection of interests with associates, customers, community, uh, various stakeholders with whom we partner and collaborate closely. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a departure from the way that we've been thinking uh, about um, sort of how we grow the right way sustainability and get the sort of goods and public goods that are part of our operation and that are necessary for sustaining our license to operate, how we get all of that right. Some of the ESG <clears throat> sort of expectations are less well-founded. Some of the, the ways of measuring ESG and sort of um, labeling something to be sort of ESG approved um, are, are less well-founded than others. There's a sense in which perhaps um, some of the business community hasn't pushed back against some of those more poorly founded ESG uh, evaluative uh, measures as much as, as it should have. It's going to need now to show um, that it's, it's collaborating vis-a-vis -vis ESG in ways that really are um, uh, the right metrics based on sort of the appropriate real uh, quantitative considerations um, and uh, that, it's, that, it's, um, that it's really rooted in the business case. I think if they can't do that, they're going to have a harder time sustaining their, their ESG commitments. Do you mind if I just offer a perspective as well? Just one other thing on, on, on ESG standards, um, and I mentioned this on, a, on another panel the other day, is we have been talking a little bit about the, um, the importance of the rule of law and how the mechanisms for democratic participation, etc., may not be in place in some countries where, um, where corruption is an issue and where you need all the private sector to be, to be, to be stepping up. One, one thing that we're interested in looking at and in the early stages of thinking about is... Is it would it be possible for ESG standards, and particularly the standards that go to companies' approach to anti-corruption, to be a little bit clearer and more of a clear incentive to the private sector to take action on anti-corruption throughout their operations globally? That might potentially um, be a driver that would that would, op would cause some drive for the, or you know, give some uh, some uh, weight and energy behind the anti-corruption movement even in countries that don't have the democratic mechanisms, because if you've got a multinational subject to a good ESG standards being held to account, for example, to promote beneficial ownership transparency or to promote rule of law, um, 
then that might be a potential lever to to push forward some of these anti-corruption measures, even in countries where the democratic, um, you know, structures are not there or they're or they're they're not working. Another little uh, sort of parallel issue that we're interested in in exploring, um, which is similar, it just I mention it just because it, it goes to the potential power of standard setting, is we are seeing some of our customers in the battery raw materials space come and uh, be very interested about whether we're complying with industry standards around sustainability. So um, because uh, the um, battery raw materials are very close to the retail customer, um, which is unusual for the mining industry um, and the first time really we've been so close to retail customers. Um, the sustainability of the supply chain is a brand issue for the automakers and so we are having direct conversations with automakers about our sustainability standards and again one, one thing that we're interested in, in looking at early days is could we put clearer anti-corruption metrics in those industry standards therefore driving um, a, a further uh, incentive, commercial incentive towards adopting those anti-corruption programs. And really what I obviously would like to see is differentiation, having those standards, both the ESG standards and the, um, and the, the industry standards, differentiate between companies that are really doing the right thing and companies which are just ticking the box. Um, and ideally there should be price differentiation in the commodities that we produce that would further, that would further empower that, that private sector push um, towards anti-corruption. Sorry, a bit of a long-winded response, no, but, but I thought it was I, relevant to your question on standards. Uh, uh, Rizio, do you want to offer any thoughts on the, on the questions? I just want to thank the World Justice Project for the Rule of Law Index because it has been really useful uh, for, for not only the work that we are doing in the country, but also to use it to work together with other sectors to improve the quality of democracy and rule of law in the country. You are an excellent reference for countries as Ecuador, and, and thank you very much for that. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> All right. Uh, who's got the microphone now? All right. Gentlemen. Good afternoon. Thanks so, much, thanks so much, Andrew, for putting together this really impressive panel. I'm Jose Miguel Bello. I'm from the University of Sydney currently, although I'm a public official of Spain. I have two questions which are kind of difficult, so I would be very satisfied if you answer just one of them. The first one is in relation to grey corruption, grey areas of corruption, and concre concretely about facilitation payments. How do you deal with those that are like theoretically legal, although not in Australia anymore, um, but uh, create a certain culture internally that are uh, setting the standards probably wrong? And the second one, I know the panel is called when interest, business interest, and anti-corruption interest align, but what when they do not align, when there is a divergence, for example, we talk about permits and licensing. So for example, with the example of the two supermarkets, um, I suppose in other situations you are in countries in which you are already there and you have good relations with government and you don't want things to be more transparent. No, you personally, you, but companies don't want to be, things to be more transparent because they are in a comfortable situation. How do you, at a global level, deal with, well, pushing for more transparency in some countries and other countries, probably the business interest is precisely the opposite. Thanks. So we have a question uh, on, first question really on the, how do you deal with the, with the gray areas, uh, uh, facilitation payments and other sorts of things where, where, where these issues may be a little more difficult to, to assess. Um, and I'll just, if anybody wants to take that one, we'll, we'll put that on the table to start with. Well, it's a controversial issue in the compliance community, yeah. but um, I'll, I'm happy to go first. So um, no doubt we could debate it for hours, but um, I mean, our position is um, we, um, we, we've taken the position that we, we outlaw them internally. Um, and we, uh, that, that's not just a, a sort of reflexive, moralistic type stance, but from, um, it's based on an understanding of how corrupt structures work in, in societies that are beset by corruption and the sort of pyramid structure that where corruption is sort of started at the, at the lower levels of government and, and, and you know, gradually escalates up. Um, and, and we just, we, we can't, um, we, we don't see any benefit in contributing to that. Um, and so um, we, we um, you know, whilst it, it, does, it does lead to, uh, it can lead to delays and, and problems, um, we just look to um, incorporate those into our business planning and, um, and make sure we've trained people to raise the, raise the problems, escalate the problems, and then use our normal escalation process. So um, 
that's, uh, that's the, my view on facilitation payments, but um, there'd be Australian companies that would come and give a different view, so. Right, and we, we take a, a, uh, the same approach. Uh, we are empowered as a US-based company by um, sort of FCPA uh, requirements. Um, but we take the same approach. Uh, should I pause there for the, on the second question? I, 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 Mauricio, do you have any comments on the first question? No. So let's go, let's go straight to the second question, which is this idea of if you're in a market that diverges from your, if, I'm, if I've got you correctly, sort of diverges from, from your, your desired strategy, your desired positions, uh, how one deals with, with that and how one might be able to use your leverage even, I guess, to, 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 to move the needle. Well, yeah, I think on that one, I mean, our, one, of the, one of the main, um, one of the drivers among many for our anti-corruption approach overall is to build trust. We know because of the nature of our business that, um, um, you know, building mines um, is disruptive for communities and so we need to win and earn communities' trust in order to do what we do um, and in order for them to grant us permission to um, develop their resources. And so um, if, we, if there is a, a non-transparent but quick permitting system, um, we can see that's not going to build trust. And so we would, we would um, you know, we would generally speaking want to invest in, in trying to um, move, towards a, move, move towards a more improved system. Um, and we would see the long-term benefit from having a trusted permitting system to be far greater than the short-term benefit of getting permits quickly, which you know, none of the community are going to accept as a sort of legitimate um, you know, permission. And so um, I think when you take a sort of trust-based approach, we would, we would look to that. As to how we achieve it, I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting question, which is a, a country a country by country and situation-specific question. But I would, you know, I would come back to the comment I made earlier that, or that we've sort of I think um, Mauricio has been making as well that um, all three parts of the of the uh, of the of the um, of the ecosystem here need to be working together, and so we would look to be working with civil society, with other companies, um, with the government, or even potentially with other governments through our embassies um, to to drive changes where we where we thought changes were needed to improve the corruption environment. So. Thank you, Dan. Um, I'll get you to, to, to respond. And then, Maurice, I'm going to come, come to you with a little bit of a twist on this question. I, I would say that, that the answer begins with, uh, similarly, um, showing the value of what we do in a, in a country. Um, we help formalize the economy. We help um, bring um, suppliers into the formal economy. We we have um, compliance requirements, therefore we train against those compliance standards. So uh, we, be, we, we help more small and medium-sized businesses become higher compliance standard companies. So showing, showing all of the, the, the public good that we're creating um, and then acknowledging the, the way that is inhibited by the frictions caused by the asymmetry that you allude to. I think how one would then deal with that and try to get that, that harmonization uh, would, would vary uh, situation to situation. Um, those would be my initial thoughts. Maurizio, our, our, our colleague's question kind of implies perhaps that multinationals and foreign investors have a certain amount of leverage when they enter a market. How, you know, I'm, I'm always been a little skeptical of that, that argument, to be honest. Um, what what is your what is your experience in Ecuador and your view from from uh, the the country level on sort of the level of influence uh, and good practice that multinationals uh, can have if you're in a situation where you know it's the other elements really are, are tough. I must say that the private sector first should not be a threat of of competition and free market. Disruption of free market is corruption. And any deliberate action against free market rules or to keep privileges in a country at any cost is corruption. I would love to have multinationals as Walmart in my country. We have a great market opportunity in Ecuador, but I'm sure that if they try to go to the country, <laughs> they will face a blockage at the very first moment 
because of what we have inside the country. And the leverage is, is, is related to local companies, not multinationals. Local traditional companies that will pay any amount of money to the government to keep their monopolies and duopolies alive. And you know that there's a huge problem. I brought some information about another problem that I didn't mention and I want to, to, to talk about it. Is the role private sector plays in political campaign financing. Because what happens, and I'm going to uh, say an experience on this thing on my local supermarkets, is that the owner of one, I think the, the, the biggest supermarket in the country, funds all candidates, all of them. Why? He doesn't care if they are good or bad, honest or dishonest. Simply by financing them, this guy seeks to ensure to keep a communication channel alive or, or present in case the candidate wins. That's the way they usually act in countries like mine. And when they put money in political campaigns, they keep this leverage alive. And they say, well, please remember that you received this money from our company and be careful if you allow another company to go into the country and to compete with us. So if you are an authority that received one or two million dollars from the supermarket owner, you will definitely think before allowing other company to come to the country. And you know how to deal with it, and you know how, how, how to get even more economic benefits from that company. And, and that's what happens, unfortunately. Okay, I'm going to offer our panelists a chance just to sum up or make any final points they'd like to make as we're, we're, we've hit the 5 o'clock hour. So uh, we'll start with Tim and then Dan and then Maurizio. Thank you. Uh, no, look, no. Um, I think it's been a it's been a really interesting discussion, and actually, a um, you know, we've covered a few slightly controversial issues, and that's actually the value of these engagements with um, with Mauricio and and. Okay, is that working? Yeah. Okay. So I was just saying it's been a very um, valuable discussion, and I think um, the fact that we've actually covered quite a few controversial issues and some of these issues you're raising, uh, I think that actually highlights the value of of the of, of dialogue. Um, and uh, I probably would just um, you know reiterate the the point that I made earlier that I think it has been a it's been a, a, a fabulous conference for the energy that that's been produced um, in in terms of having these having these discussions, and, and I do think. Um, I do think there is some there's some real momentum behind um, some of these some of these efforts, and um, looking forward to supporting um, uh, the the, the anti-corruption agenda however we can. Okay, thank you, Dan. It's been a privilege to be here. Uh, thank you for including Walmart uh, both on this panel and in, in prior discussions throughout the day. We would welcome the opportunity to work with you. Um, we are building muscle to get better at cross-sectoral work. We view it as essential. We really want to be part of strengthening the right incentives that will help behavior across sectors um, uh, be what it should be in terms of realizing uh, an anti-corruption uh, culture. Thank you for including us. Thank you. And Maurizio, the last word is yours. Once, once again, thank you very much for having us here. And it, it has been great to share this panel with you. I, I would love to hear about your good practices, and I hope someday these good practices will be implemented in my country, not only for local companies, but by your companies being present in countries like Ecuador. So hopefully that day will come soon. I just want to emphasize again the importance of working together. The only way to achieve results on transparency and integrity is working together between every single actor from every single sector private sector, public sector, civil society, academia, civic movements have to work together. Pursuing democratic values, 
open civic space, transparency and integrity. We all gain if we live in a democratic country. We all gain if we live in a country that respects rights and freedoms. Talking about freedom of expression, for example, it's the same from business owners than from an activist. So let's keep working together. Help us to recover democracy in countries that are suffering now and let's do what we must do together. So can I just have one quick end note, Mauricio? Just to let you know, we have actually recently entered Ecuador. Oh. So we're very excited to be there. I'll give you my card. We'll I keep like talking. It. We'll keep talking. That's just that, to correct the record. There you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm well, going to I'm gonna invite you to join the EITI initiative where the private sector is present with good results. Fabulous. Thank you. Mauricio, we have not yet entered Ecuador. <laughs> That's a, Yeah. I, I wish we had an MOU to sign or something right now, but what a way to end the day. But thank you very much, and, I thank, and a special thanks to the members of our audience who participated in our discussion. We hope you take, uh, take away, come out of this meeting with, with a sense, a positive sense of, of what's possible uh, when, we, when we start talking about how we can cooperate. And, and I think our challenge to you from SIPE is to think imaginatively about what engagement can look like as well, to go beyond our traditional ways of, of thinking about this and to think about the other modalities and values that are there through, uh, through cooperating with the private sector. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a good evening.